This is Maple Sugar Time here at Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore and we're showing different ways that maple sugar and maple syrup have been made throughout time. We're showing various different uh, methods used by the early Native Americans before the use of, of kettles, how pioneers and early settlers uh, use metal to uh, change the process, and then the way that the Chelberg family made syrup in the 1930s. It takes 39 gallons, we've got to boil off 39 gallons of water in order to get one gallon of syrup. And we're using a wood burning furnace, horizontal furnace, a wood burning furnace. The wood comes from the field. The maple trees, of course, are from the field. And so there's no cost other than uh, your labor. Before we actually paint any of this, I'm kind of imagining composition where there's different layers of distance through some woods. And that would be good for several uh, ideas, but one in particular would be uh, people a little closer to us, and they would be kind of the main uh, subject. So maybe two or three guys like lumberjacks that are out, and they happen to do uh, maple syrup tapping. Uh, when they're not cutting down trees. <laughs> and we just want to kind of very simply, I don't know, some kind of angle, sideways or three-quarter view of the sled and the horse tree somewhere in this area of the picture, not right in the center, and the people would be in this area here putting buckets on, say, the back of a sled. I, the sled could be either coming toward us and the horse is this way, but then everything would be on the back end far and it might be behind the tree even. So I'm just imagining more of the sleds going this way. You know, and the buckets would be on this side, on the back side of the sled, and that's what we'd see. And the people would be right there next to that, so they'd be a little closer. Now at the same time, something that's very important is the horizon line. That's going to be our eye level as the viewer looking at the picture. So I'm keeping that right around here, which is where the buckets are going to be. We, that will get your attention more. We'll be focusing on them versus higher or lower. Sometimes we actually uh, take one of our stills and copy that sketch somehow and use that as our background and just draw what we imagine on top of that. Here we're making up the entire thing almost. And I also want these to be lumberjacks, so I'm going to have some wood piled onto this sled as well in the front. They are out maybe gathering some wood and they use the sled for that too because they're going to need that to uh, fire up these kettles and stuff. To, so I, we're just trying this. We might make a few sketches because we don't know what will look good until you see something somehow. And then you'll do some foreground, middle ground out there. It could be bright. Our background dark again. So all these things will stand out from each other. Hmm? Now, Bob, you what type of horses are these, and what would they normally be used for? Uh, these are Belgian draft horses, um, and they're primarily used for farming. Um, the Amish community uses the Belgians uh, extensively for their farming purposes because they're, they're gentle, uh, they're very easy, willing workers, and they'll do what you're asked. I keep hearing the term draft horse, which are these, but there are there's lots of different draft horses, right? Yes, there, there's different breeds of draft horses. These are Belgian draft horses. There's also Percheron draft horses. Clydesdales, which everybody knows as the Budweiser Clydesdale horses. 
and uh, shires. I then asked Bob what makes a breed of horse a draft horse. Uh, the draft horse primarily uh, what distinguishes the draft horse size its size are the size of their feet. They're larger. Uh, that way they can, as they're plowing the fields, they can uh, get better traction for their host. Their feet are much bigger than a standard bred horse. And that's all then the color would matter more to d determine what type of horse they are? Or do these come in black? I don't know. Uh, no, uh, Belgians are usually a, a sorrel or a roan color horse, um, or a little bit lighter. Um, Pertrans can be uh, black, white. Dapple gray. Are those colors so. brown for artist terms? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Brown. Burnt sienna. Yep. We would say, oh, that's a burnt sienna mm -hmm. color. We're kind of, uh, you know, kicking around ideas, maybe something with lumberjacks and that type of thing. So it would be appropriate to use them for They could definitely be used for lumberjacking. Um, so they're very willing workers and. Uh, that's what they're bred for. They, they want to work. They don't want to stand around and do nothing. They want to work. Uh, and, and if we did that, uh, what would they be working with as far as equipment or uh, the sled or something? How would they pull the log? Uh, sometimes they'll be pulling a sled. Um, it's called a bob sled. Uh, you can use a team with that, uh, a pair of horses, or you can use a single sled horse. Uh, sometimes it's, you can use what's called a four cart. Uh, which the team is hooked up to the cart, and then the chain is dragging the uh, logs behind them. All right, well, we thank you a lot. This helps us think of ideas to paint, and hopefully we'll paint them correctly, and we'll go to you for advice if we're screwing something up. <laughs> well, thank you. I hope I can provide it. Thank you. With winter and the maple sugar seasons both ending, I had to arrange a shoot quickly. So I chose Deep River Park as our background, asked they leave a few buckets on the trees for us, and found a draft horse living right near the park. Thanks to Bob, I know what horse breeds might be more appropriate for this, and how a sled might look. I have a design in mind, and will just use a sheet of plywood the size of this sled, I imagine. With this, everyone will be positioned right, and moving naturally as if a sled was really there. I knew how high I wanted the camera position and what tree we would pose next to, so the plan was to shoot the models various ways left to right and with the sled facing forward and backward. And keep in mind, working with models, and in this case a restless horse, your time is going to be limited, so you don't want to be deciding what to shoot after you get on location. Make sure this is all figured out well in advance. And by working quickly, you have lots of poses to choose from later, and I, you I won't regret like missing a pose you wish you had to paint. So let's take it from here. And we did our preliminary background shoots, and we're trying to get just something similar to what we shot before. So we'll go ahead and do that. And Peter's just up there kind of keeping company with the horse and he, we have kind of a, a generational thing here I thought would be nice for a painting. The veterans teaching the younger ones how to do all this. One a little farther this way. So let's try uh, uh, the, the moving action pose. Like most shoots, I videotaped our models moving normally. This gives us thousands of natural looking pose choices in just a few minutes but we still need to zoom in close to see details right, of one, everything. One time, for this, I have them hold you. still for any poses I may freeze from the video later. Holding still, the freeze frames won't have blurry areas. And often when you're shooting something, you might think you know what you want, but this, when people just do what they do naturally, often they come up with a, something better than you would think of. All right, so now we'll do the same thing and then hold the, hold the middle pose. You don't need the water and all that. Here, I'll get the close-ups of everyone. Sometimes I shoot these still poses with a still camera for the sharpest picture. However, pretending to be in motion is never as natural looking. We don't want to forget things like hands, fingers. You might have to see that if the painting is large enough. It's easy to forget that until you go to paint it and then you wish you had it. So the live action freeze frames serve as our main composition. and The still poses simply help me see and understand everything we're looking at, even if they don't match exactly. 
Okay, Don and Steve, you can take a break. Now Peter. Peter and the horse. The goal here is to make a video I can use later to find any information I might need when working on the painting. Sometimes watching the video is enough. Or I can freeze the video, print that frame, and keep it near my easel. He's kind of your buddy. He likes you, that's why you, you're the one walking him around. And if Peter gets any maple sap on his hands, it won't be there for long working with a horse known for his sweet tooth. They have close, medium, and then wide, full shots. We're doing I also made sure to get shots with lots of foreground. This will be helpful if I decide to paint in other foreground subjects, such as animal snow tracks, fallen trees, or maybe a small creek. We did the same thing from three positions, center, left, and right. This that, gave me Steve. plenty of like options to choose too. from later and the information needed is. to paint the pose that portrays our models thing. best. I, I kinda like this. Our last pose has the horse facing us. This version brings our attention more towards the horse than the maple buckets. I like it as well, but the sled design may be an issue if the buckets are loaded on the front end. I'll have to try out designs before we make a choice. And you'll notice it makes more sense like you see in TV interviews all the time the the where the, the space is in the front the of someone like they're looking the forward. And they played a very... If you put it to the rear, it just looks strange. And you'll see that in interviews and compositions and video all the time. Well, we have our first set of references up here. And the first thing we're going to do is change this to a snow scene. We didn't have that in our photo shoot, but we did have that in our previous reference. And that was kind of what I had in mind all along. So that's not only going to have more snow in it, it's going to influence the color or what we call the mother color of the entire picture. So we, that will be uh, determining the color, even the colors that we have with our models in the landscape. It's going to be much different, kind of more of a bluish tone towards the end of the painting. We might even change this to falling snow. Uh, we'll, we'll decide that later. Uh, but the first thing you know, we want to do is have a color palette that's more along the lines of our snow reference. That's why we shot that on a different day. So we'll kind of just get started and come up with this mother color. We'll basically use kind of a, our complements to make kind of a, an off-white kind of on the blue side. Start out with blue, ultramarine blue and white. Okay. I think that should be enough color and we'll darken this just slightly. We'll put a little brown in there just so we can see it. Uh, but not too dark because we don't want that to mix in with our snow colors later on. This will just be, we're using kind of a stiffer hog hair brush and we can draw a little better. We'll just draw lines and that will just land kind of the composition. This concludes part one of our painting, Family Traditions. Be sure to see the making of this and other paintings in our Lumberjack Maple Sugar series. Check your local how-to broadcaster hearing the complete painter television show.